Have you guys heard of um, Air France Flight 447? No, no, but I'm pretty no. sure we're about to. This actually is the precedent to the Malaysian Airlines uh, flight MH370 that Still happened just a, a, a few years ago yeah. back in 2015. Still have no idea. Just bye-bye. Disappeared. Aliens. Air France Flight 447 uh, took off from Galileo International Airport. So Galileo. like Galileo. Yeah, but it's, it's Portuguese, so it's like Galileo. They're like Galileo. Galileo. International Airport at 7.29 p.m. This was May 31st, 2009. The Air France Flight 447 would soon enter the constantly rewritten book of major airline disasters, unfortunately. The flight was an Airbus A330. So this is a modern, you know, this is 2009. It's a modern 300-passenger um, plane, I think. And it ha- it was heading to Paris, France, with a planned 13-hour duty time. That's <laughs> that's flight duration. So <laughs> seriously, that's that's <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. He's having fun. He's also the only one that's had any natties. Uh, Look how happy life he is. It's so much better when you're drunk. He's rolling around on his belly. <laughs> <laughs> Look, he's smacking his bottom now. Whee! Oh Jesus. <laughs> That was funny because of how his hands were placed. Uh, look at those. Yeah. <laughs> do another one. Do another one. Escalated quickly. Wow. Uh, I don't know that. Is there an air marshal on board? I feel like it's someone should insane. sort of regulate the nudity, the butthole nudity. B27, that was actually kind of funny. Do that again. We can see it. Charlotte, look at this. Look, at, look down there. He's going to do it. Oh, uh, you're on America's hun- Funniest Home Video. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. I don't even care that he snuck booze on. This is pretty good. This man is a straight-up clown. <laughs> How do you get to come here's to one for the Here's one for the back row. <laughs> <laughs> Heading to Paris, France with a planned 13-hour duty time. So that's flight duration, also pre-flight planning, um, you know, landing, and then hotel accommodations, getting every staff... Uh, situated. Normally, the A330 is designed to be flown by a crew of two pilots, but due to this longer flight path, the crew on that evening was Captain Marc Dubois. He had over 10,000 flying hours, 58 years old, and two first officers. So the first one was David Robert. He had over 6,000 flying hours. He was 37 years old. And Pierre Bonin with over 2,000 flying hours at 32 years old. So all together, they had a shit ton of experience. A whole bunch. The A330 had a rest cabin just behind the cockpit because it could just keep on going. Um, Captain Dubois, who again was uh, 58 years old, he sent First Officer Robert to rest for the first break period. So they took off at 7.29 p.m. And Captain Dubois sent First Officer Robert to rest for the first break period. And he was going to take the second one because it's a fucking 13-hour international flight from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to Paris, France. Wow. You are going... Wow. Some fancy motherfuckers, right? And also, it's Rio de Janeiro. Rio. They don't say R's in Portuguese. Everything is... If it begins with an R, it start, it, you say with an H. Captain Dubois was uh, going to take that second rest for himself. At 1.55 a.m., the captain woke First Officer Robert told him to uh, take his place, which would be, you know, the the main in command. And he briefed both of the first officers before he took his rest six minutes later at 2.01 a.m. This is all local time. A couple minutes after that, the pilots warned the cabin crew the aircraft would be, like, get, getting into really, really hard turbulence. Um, this was in the intertropical convergence zone where the different trade winds all, like, hit from the northeast and southeast um, like lat, like almost like a this like triangle, and that results in either either stagnant calm winds, like nothing is going on, or the most violent supercells, supercells that can go up to one hundred and twenty thousand feet. Damn! Wow! They started getting um, hail and grapple. Do you know what grapple is? G R Janine Garoppolo. Grubble is like sleet. It's like that, like hail, like ice that just like clings. Oh yeah, and it's just like immediately, it's like it looks plasma. like the plane's freezing when yeah. you like look out and you're up yep. there and it looks yeah. So okay. that's grubble. that's grubble. So hail and grubble starts hitting the plane at two o one a.m. 
This is where they hit the first snag that will drop them out of the sky. Pitot tubes, P-I-T-O-T. They're small tubes that are airspeed indicators, and they're located underneath airplanes. They're located underneath the cockpit. They became completely clogged at 2.10 a.m. When the airplane didn't know how fast it was going anymore, it disengaged completely from autopilot to alternate law two, in quotes. This is manual flying. This immediately caused the craft to roll to the right from turbulence, which then made the pilot overcorrect to the left, shuddering the plane again. So you have to imagine passengers are immediately like, what the, the fuck, fuck is happening? This would happen for several fucking minutes. Uh, oh, just going no. back and forth once again. Just this pitch happened for 30 seconds as First Officer Bonin was fine-tuning the manual controls because he saw it. He goes, okay, well then, uh, you know, I have to do this, I have to do this. He suddenly pulled up on his side stick, which pitched the plane's nose up, which was excessive and entirely unnecessary. This caused the first stall warning. Stall, stall. Since the angle of attack stall, tolerance stall. was exceeded... So they had a flame out. You know, they were flying blind at this point. They had no gauge. They didn't see how fast they were going. So when they heard stall, First Officer Bonin, who was 32, had the least amount of experience engaged in solo mode. He's now pulling up, uh, nose up. Their speed is immediately dropping. It dropped from 315 miles per hour to 60. Jesus Christ. Wow. That's <laughs> <That's enough. laughs> From half the speed of sound to I-4 on Thursday. Due, <laughs> yep. Due to, the inte- uh, due to the attack increase, Flight 447 climbed from its cruising altitude of 35,000 feet, climbing 7,000 feet per minute Jeez. in this takeoff nose-up approach. Only takeoffs do that kind of nose-up, and they even do 2,000 to uh, 3,000. So, like, never 7,000 feet per minute. At 2.11 a.m., the aircraft had climbed to its max altitude of 38,000 feet. That's up there. The nose was now at 16 degrees. Thrust was fully forward. These these engines were going 100%, both of them. So this thing could easily do over 1,000. The first of 75 stall warnings activated while the nose was at 30 degrees as the plane descended, of which it never took further control. First Officer Robert took control, pushed forward to angle the nose down, which is the correct thing to do. Yeah. You then n- angle the nose down, restart the engine to get another flame, and then you can throttle forward, at, as crazy as it sounds, at the sky to build lift. Have you ever seen, like at an air show, when they do controlled stalls, Yes. That is just terrifying to think of that happening uncontrolled. You know, when you see the planes do that and when they just stop and just start, like, basically leaf in the wind. <laughs> and then they'll kick in the engines go because, you know, they're doing it on purpose. I've actually done that in assessment before. How really? am I not surprised? How am I not surprised by that in any shape or form? Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the word I need to describe it. I mean, it wasn't like as intense as that, but a friend of mine was getting his pilot's license and he took me out and he like did a couple zero gravity falls with me. It was great. That is incredible. Yeah. So, um, first officer Robert um, took control. This is at two eleven a.m. and pushed forward to angle the nose down. So he's flying at the left side of the plane and the standard. Hey, I'm fucking flying this thing. How about you? You know, settle down. <laughs> However, <laughs> I don't think that's the terminology they used at that point in, in that, that calm tune of voice. Simadana. Hey, buddy, come on. First Officer Bonin, to his right, was pulling back, canceling out this effort. <laughs> and there is a video on YouTube where you see exactly what the left officer is doing and what the right officer is doing. It's super heartbreaking to even watch. Um,. Captain Dubois entered, heard the stall warnings, constantly fucking playing, it would never stop, and said, what the hell are you doing? The altitude was now 35,000 feet, and the nose angle never dropped below 35 degrees again. So He's almost shooting for the moon. Yes. First Officer Robert responded with, we've lost all control of the airplane. We don't understand anything. We've tried everything. And then, climb, 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 climb. 
the plane descended at 10,912 feet per minute Jesus. and remain stalled for the entire three and a half minutes from 38,000 oh my fucking God. feet. When first Just officer... dead weight. When first officer Boonin replied, but I've been at maximum nose up for a while. Captain Dubois realized that Bonin was causing the stall and he shouted no 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 don't climb lastly the ground proximity warning system engaged Ugh. with an ominous warning of an impending crash into the Atlantic Ocean Bonin realizing the situation was now hopeless said fuck we're going to crash this can't be but what's happening the last CVR recording was Captain Dubois saying 10 degrees pitch attitude Flight 47 crashed belly first into the ocean at 175 miles per hour. Oh, oh my God. That's hitting concrete. You're not hitting water. You're hitting concrete at that speed. Two years later, at a cost of hundreds of thousands of hours and millions of dollars, Air France found the wreckage of Flight 447 at a distance of two miles below the surface of the water. They actually used the same technology wow. that James Cameron did when he found the Titanic. James Cameron to the rescue once again. With its CVR, <laughs> with its CVR still intact, they found the plane was still responsive at all points during the flight. The error was a lack of communication between pilots, which, which ultimately paid the biggest cost. Wow, that's crazy! Just that the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. Exactly, that's, that's amazing. I mean, not amazing. It's terrifying and horrible. <clears throat> but just when, when human error, just human error at that level. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is a little getting a little shaky.